Welcome to the WREL Daily Download. I'm Jack Hagel. Election Day is upon us, and come Wednesday, North Carolinians could have more Democrats representing them in Congress. The story is more than just about voter turnout. WREL state government reporter Brian Anderson has been following the House races for our NC Capital team. He's here to break it all down for us. Brian, welcome back. Thanks for having me. Election Day is Tuesday. That's essentially an end point for what has been a very long process in who will represent the state in Congress. Yeah, so we've had a months-long redistricting fight here in North Carolina that started last year. And so basically every decade, or what's supposed to be every decade, I should say, you have these new voting maps that come out for the state legislature and for Congress. And so basically where we're at right now is a court struck down those maps proposed by state lawmakers and said, hey, for this year only, we're going to use these new voting lines for 14 districts. It used to be 13, but with population growth, it's now 14. So basically the old map that was in place had eight Republicans and five Democrats. And proposals by Republican lawmakers could have given Republicans 11 of the 14 seats up for grabs. And if you look at the current map right now, it's plausible that it's a 7-7 split. So quite the dilution from what Republicans had hoped for going into this process, and maybe a couple pickup opportunities for Democrats here. So that's what it means for the state. What does it mean nationally for the parties? Well, nationally, what's at stake here is control of the U.S. House, which could mean control of President Joe Biden's legislative agenda. He has narrow majorities in the U.S. House currently and a a basic 50-50 split in the Senate that goes his way. And if even one of those chambers flips to a Republican side, that's going to really undermine what Joe Biden wants to do. And what are his key initiatives? Well, I mean, infrastructure was his big thing that he had wanted to do and did do. Uh, But there's still a lot more that's unchecked. There's voting rights. There's uh, comprehensive immigration reform. There's uh, gun legislation that didn't go as far as he would have liked. Uh, There's just a number of things on universal pre-K, Medicare Medicare for all. Uh, So many things hang in the balance with this election. Now, this map, it's only going to be short-lived. This is just one term. Uh, What what will things look like in the next election cycle? So where we are in the process is Republicans will get to go to the drawing board, assuming it's still a Republican-controlled legislature, as we expect after this year's election. So they'll redraw the congressional map. Exactly. They're going to redraw the congressional map. The question is really, are they going to redraw it next year? There's been some chatter, particularly from Republican House Speaker Tim Moore, that maybe they might come back at the end of this session in December though that seems like more of a plausible outcome if they lost their majorities, which isn't really expected. So next year is where we're going to have just another redistricting fight. Uh, And that could be more intense than the first because maybe you have a conservative state Supreme Court that could side with the Republicans. Tell us about that. Tell me about those Supreme Court races and why they might matter to these districts. So right now, Democrats have a 4-3 majority in the state Supreme Court. And that's really allowed them to, the Democrats to kind of thwart the will of the Republican lawmakers. And that's because the court is the terminus for a lot of these challenges to these maps, correct? Yes. What happens at the state legislature is inevitably going to be challenged by uh, uh, the the Democrats or voting rights groups. And it ultimately seems to work its way up to the state Supreme Court. And right now you have two races up for grabs that are currently held by Democrats. So if Republicans win just one of those two races, or both of them, they're going to be in control of the state Supreme Court. And these Republican candidates for state Supreme Court have already signaled more of a deferential view of the checks and balances between the executive and and the really the legislative and the judicial branch. So what they're saying is, we think that we should narrowly interpret what state lawmakers are doing And that would seem to suggest less likelihood of overturning voting maps. Let's take a quick break. When we come back, we'll break down some of the biggest races across the state. Welcome back to the WREL Daily Download. We're talking with WREL state government reporter Brian Anderson about the state's congressional elections and what to expect on Tuesday. That's election day. Brian, let's go east to west uh, in the state and talk about some of the races that you're watching. Uh, Let's start with the 1st Congressional District. So that's the race to fill the seat of retiring Congressman G.K. Butterfield, who's long represented 
this district, and it still is a blue-leaning district, but it's not a, a Democratic guarantee. It's arguably the second most competitive congressional race in this state, and it stretches from the city of Wilson over to Elizabeth City near the Outer Bank. So it's quite an expansive area that could take you an hour and a half or maybe even two hours, depending on traffic, just to traverse that district alone. And what's at stake right now is you have Republican Sandy Smith and Democratic State Senator Don Davis who are going at it. And this is a very important race. Well, tell me about the candidates. So Don Davis, state senator, he is a military veteran as well, Presbyterian minister. He is coming into this race with a more moderate message. He was successful in his primary battle against Democratic state senator Erica Smith, who had really kind of challenged him from the left flank of the party. So Don Davis is someone who is really running toward the middle, saying, I can work with Republicans the recently passed infrastructure money, I'm going to be able to get that money into the district and make sure it goes to our community. Now, Sandy Smith is really messaging hard this issue of the economy being front and center in voters' minds. She says, this is the key issue. We've had Democratic majorities in the U.S. House, the U.S. Senate, and the White House. Why on earth would we want to keep that Democratic power going? So she's really saying... Congress controls the purse strings. We can rein in inflation that way. And she's a businesswoman as well. So she thinks she has the relevant experience to get the country in in what she would consider the right direction. Now, closer to home is the closest and perhaps most contentious race, and that's the 13th, right? Tell us about that. Yeah, no love lost here between Wiley Nickel and Bo Hines, a very contentious race. And it is the most competitive race in this entire state. And frankly, one of the most competitive in the entire country. It's one of just a few dozen that are being watched nationwide that could really tilt in either direction. And this is a district that covers a a good chunk of the triangle. It includes Southern Wake County, which still has some Raleigh city limits in that. It also includes uh, parts of Wake being that Southern Wake County. It also includes Wayne, Harnett, parts of those, and all of Johnston County. And this is a district that's sort of become a microcosm for the state because it's slowly and slowly become more diverse racially, more diverse politically. A lot of people from out of state are coming to this district. Some longtime district residents are flocking out of the district because of affordability concerns. And it's become less rural over time and a lot more suburban communities popping up here and there. The key place to watch is going to be Johnston County. It's an area that went for Trump by 24 points in 2020. In 2016, it was a Trump plus 30. So it's slowly becoming a little bit more democratic. And I'm watching Johnston County to see how Hines is doing. And it's not just the district that's becoming more moderate. It sounds like the candidates have sort of followed that track too during the campaign. Yeah, both of them. I mean, Wiley Nickel, he's known as one of the most liberal state lawmakers. He votes against his party um, on some key issues like the 2021 budget last year. He voted against something that a lot of Democratic state lawmakers supported. He voted against an early into the pandemic COVID spending bill that a lot of Democrats supported. And for Bo Hines, he's a 27-year-old Republican political newcomer. So he doesn't have as much of a, he doesn't have any legislative track record. So the interesting thing about Bo Hines is you have to look how he was campaigning last year. He was touting prominently on his website the endorsements he received from Madison Cawthorn, Matt Gates, Marjorie Taylor Greene. All controversial re- Republicans. Yeah, from North Carolina with Cawthorn, from, jo- from Georgia with Marjorie Taylor Greene, from Florida with Matt Gates. Very controversial people. He actually went to uh, Mar-a-Lago to meet with Trump in December as they were sort of crafting, hey, where, where's the best home for, for Bo Hines? So these are, this, this is a candidate who has been known to be on the further right end of his party. But now he's sort of softening his messaging. And he openly acknowledges that, saying, you know, I've got to appeal to a general election audience, not a primary audience anymore. So on the issue of abortion, that's one thing where Bo Hines has really kind of walked back some of his earlier positions, where in the primary he was very clear, pro-life. At one point he said no exceptions in talking to reporters Uh, But he's largely been pretty clear that 
you know, he doesn't support abortion except when a woman's life is at stake. But in recent weeks, he's talked to WRL about this issue and said that he would be open to exceptions for rape and incest, but on a case by case basis. Now, in the center of the state, Congresswoman Kathy Manning is trying to hold on to her seat. Some say that's also a close one. Well, this is just outside the Greensboro area, and it's a D plus nine district. That means it's a place that historically has elected Democrats is still likely to. And frankly, it's not a race that many people are watching uh, because you don't have a formidable Republican opponent with the same cash advantage, the fundraising advantage, the experience and connections that Kathy Manning has. So that's still likely to go to Manning. But it is one of these closer races based on just voting patterns. And if you have a huge Republican wave that carries and translates to down-ballot candidates, it could be one to watch, but it would be widely expected to go to Manning. And out West, there's one race that we don't expect to be super close, but we're definitely keeping an eye on it just because it got so much attention during the primary, and that's the 11th. Yeah, and that's uh, not with Madison Cawthorn running. He was ousted in the primary by state senator. Uh, that, that would be Chuck Edwards, the Republican state senator. And so with Cawthorn not on the general election ballot, that's one that's going to hurt Democratic chances. They were expecting him to be the candidate and frankly hoping for him to be the candidate because of a bunch of personal political hits that he's taken. Cawthorn has been known for controversy. Chuck Edwards has been known for uh, really just sort of being a, a, a loyal party leader uh, who's not known for controversies, attacks. Uh, but he's running against Jasmine Beach Ferreira in this race, who's a Buncombe County commissioner, local party activist. And she is a, a person who has gotten a lot of fundraising, largely from the primary and messaging, hey, I'm, I might be running against Cawthorn. Uh, but it's still at least a, a, a somewhat competitive district in that we've seen frustrations from Republican voters in this area with Madison Cawthorn. So maybe that could dis make Republicans not want to show up as much. But from what we've seen, it seems like it's clearly a favorable race for Chuck Edwards to win. Well, I know you're going to keep a close eye on those races and all the House races on election night. Thanks, Brian. Thank you. For Brian's complete breakdown of North Carolina's congressional races, visit the NC Capital section of WREL.com. And don't forget to join us on election night. That's Tuesday. Tune into WREL and visit WREL.com for the latest on races throughout the state, up and down the ticket throughout the evening. Thanks for listening to the WREL Daily Download and for making us part of your morning routine. Another great way to get WREL news is the Morning Briefing Newsletter. You can find it in your inbox every morning with triangle news, events, and headlines to get you ready for the day. Sign up at wrel.com newsletter.